Good morning. The first scripture reading this morning is from the New Testament, from the book of Titus, from the second chapter. Be reading verses 11 through 14, and we're using a Red Church Bible. That's on page 1159. Again, the second chapter of Titus, verses 11 through 14, on page 1159. Titus writes that for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Our second reading this morning is from the ninth chapter of Isaiah, verses 6 and 7. It's on page 671 of the Red Pew Bible. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the word of the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would touch our hearts. I pray that in my weakness this morning, that you might be made strong among your people. We give you this time, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So folks, this morning I want to speak to you uh, on on Isaiah chapter 9, verses uh, 6 and 7, and I want to speak to you about a spirit of hope and expectation. Now... That's a timely message for any Sunday, but especially as we begin another Advent season. Today, this Sunday, begins the Advent season, four Sundays leading up to uh, Christmas Day. And as believers celebrate and enter worldwide, and we enter into the Christmas season, uh, Christmas seems to always bring, um, you know, a renewed sense of... um, Hope, it brings a renewed sense of expectation. I mean, why else do people go crazy, uh, you know, with the gifts and the glitter and all the decorations, right? But if we were to take the time to get beyond the commercialization of Christmas, which, by the way, I hate, and we take the time to get beyond all the tinsel and the glitter and the gifts, what are we left with? We're left with the Savior who brings a spirit of hope and expectation. I was talking to somebody the other day about the simplicity of the Christmas story. You know, Christ not being born in a palace, but in a manger, in a cave, or a barn. 
you know, accessible to all people. Let me tell you, if he was born in Herod's palace, you and I could not relate now, could we? Right? If we take the time to get beyond all the commercialization of Christmas, we're left with a savior who brings a spirit of hope and expectation to the world. And the message of hope and expectation is a, is a message that everybody can rally around. I mean, who doesn't want hope and who doesn't want to be expected? Uh, who does not want and hope for expectation to be for all people? Who does not want hope and expectation to be upon every nation? Who does not hope and expect for a better future? Who does not hope and expect a more pro prosperous, peaceful, and blessed state of affairs in the world? I would, I would say that we would all want that. Now, that being said, the reality is that there are two competing visions for hope and expectation. We have God's vision, and then we have the world's vision. One is eternal, one is temporal. One will never be destroyed. God promises us that the other will be burned up. One will be in Christ, and one will be in a false Messiah. And, and I would suggest to you that these two competing visions are very, very obvious in the world today. The church carries God's vision and the gospel of Christ. The message of hope and expectation. That's what we carry. Whether it's on Sunday morning or when you leave these walls, you carry the message of hope and expectation. And then we have the state. I'll define the state as all worldly government. It carries a false message of hope and expectation, which only leads to more government control. Because every time they promise you something, every time they give you something, they've got you by the neck right where they want you to be. Amen? Think about it. We just had a presidential election. Uh, hope and expectation was bound up in 150 million people going to the polls. Give or take a few, right? Actually, if we get rid of the dead people who voted, the dead votes, so to speak, then we have several million less votes, right? From 150 million. And then if we remove the illegal votes we have even several million more less than the 150 million less the dead votes. And then if you get to the bottom of the software glitch that seems to have flipped thousands of votes and they're trying to prove that right now in court, then we might be able to get even rid of some more millions of votes. That's, that's the vision of the state and the world. You have to actually be deaf, dumb, and blind not to think that fraud did not take place this past election. I mean, let me ask you this. How does a rigged election, and this is not the first time it's happened, you know this, right? Because in 1960, there was a rigged election that threw the, the presidential election to JFK over Richard Nixon. And it's documented and it's proven. And, and I heard a presidential historian one time say, well, that's how you have to understand Watergate. Nixon was paranoid because he knew that the election was stolen from him the first time. Doesn't make it right, but that's how you have to understand Watergate. But I ask you this, how does a rigged election provide hope and expectation? It doesn't. It undermines the very pillars of our democratic republic. And yet, I'm going to digress. I'm not going to fill you with politics this morning. But half of the people that voted almost a month ago had their hope and expectation shattered, and about half had their hope and expectation fulfilled. Now, putting all that aside, I want you to consider the message of both candidates. 
the messages of both candidates were temporal. Uh, did Joe Biden or Donald Trump offer you an eternal hope and expectation? Of course not. Did they promise you a resurrection from the dead? Absolutely not. They're going to die themselves. Did they offer you the gift of eternal life? We all know the answer to that one. So why was everybody hopeful when they went to the polls to vote? I'll tell you why. Because hope springs eternal in the human heart. Eternity, Solomon says, is bound up in the heart of men and women. And so there's this out-of-the-world expectation that we all have, and we seek to fill it in a temporal way at the ballot box. And yet it never satisfies. We seek to fill it and find it in some sort of earthly politician. And we easily buy into the vision that's offered by government, don't we? It's my opinion that politicians have hijacked the message and promise of hope and expectation. And yet, they never to rarely deliver on what they say, do they? And if they do, they deliver to the rich, not the poor. And if they deliver, they deliver to special interests and not the individual. That's what they do. Now, Donald Trump is the first president in my lifetime that I can remember that seems to have fulfilled all of what he's promised. Boy, they got him out real quick, didn't they? Or at least they're trying. Trump is the expectation. He's not the rule. And we know that politicians rarely to never, never deliver, and yet what do we do? We still in, fall into the same platitudes, the same hope, the same temporal vision. We buy the lies over and over and over again. And when we do that, we typically take our eyes off of God, don't we? Uh, I guess a couple days after the election, I ran into a person that I know who voted for Donald Trump. And we were talking about what we believe is, you know, the, the, the stealing of the election. But you know what he said to me? He said, it's not going to change my life. I still have to get up in the morning and go to work. So I thought about that. Generally, that's true. Until full-blown socialism is what you and I and everyone in the house has to live through, and then it's misery for all, and it will change your life. So I started to think about the whole message of hope and expectation. And the whole message of hope and expectation is bound up in the unadulterated word of God that is preached in the churches from week to week. That's the message of hope. Jesus Christ, that's the message of expectation. That's the message of changed lives. He's the only one who's really going to change your life. Not some politician who promises you the world. So when I, we take a look at Isaiah chapter 9 here, it's a prophecy that, that every, every Christmas season you read it, it brings a renewed sense and spirit of hope and expectation. Every single Christmas season, it's a reminder that God has delivered on his promise. Every Christmas light or tree put up, every light that's put on the tree, every light that's hung reminds us that God's light has entered the world. Uh, you know, again, I, it, the commercialization of Christmas, as much as I hate it, it reminds me that God's light has entered the world. Now, uh, what I want to do is I, I, I want to quickly put this prophecy in its context. Um, take a look at the uh, first line of verse 6. For unto us a child is born. This is the promised child prophecy that fits with the earlier prophecy in Genesis 3, verse 15. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned? God promised them a savior, a redeemer from sin and death. So this is a fulfillment, a further down payment that God is going to deliver on his promise. This, this verse here is known as the proto-evangelium, proto meaning first, 
Evangelium meaning announcement of good news. Right in, right in Genesis, in the garden, God says, I'm going to solve your problem. Boy, is his, are his mercies new every morning. And this is a, a promise of a redeemer from sin and death. That's hope. And that's expectation. Do you have that hope and expectation in your heart this morning? At, at the heart of, of hope and expectation, it's that life would get better, right? That's what it is. That a savior would come, death would be conquered, and there would be a return to paradise. That's how Adam and Eve understood the prophecy. They didn't understand it through a politician or some sort of promise of government. They understood it through the promises of God. They didn't buy into a platitude. And it's this message of hope and expectation that Adam and Eve and all the people of God from the beginning of time have embraced and held on to. No matter how bad it gets. What did your husband say, ma'am? The best is yet to come. Because that's life. That's freedom. That's eternal peace and joy and happiness. And so Isaiah's prophecy here fits in with an earlier prophecy. If you go back to chapter 7, verse 14, there was a prophecy regarding a miraculous birth that was foretold regarding a child. We know as we go over into Matthew that it's the fulfillment of the virgin birth in Jesus Christ. And so Isaiah 9 here gives us more insight into who this child is. What he will do. You know, I, I, I was reflecting on this, but Isaiah is the, of, of all the prophets, he foresees the kingdom of God coming more than all the other prophets. Daniel's pretty good at it too. But he sees the kingdom of God coming and God coming for his people to deliver comfort and hope. Well, this is a tremendous prophecy, folks. And so, hope and expectation, if you think about it, it prevailed from Adam and Eve forward to Isaiah's day. It prevailed. Isaiah doubles down with the reinforcement of this child prophecy. And for 700 years, hope and expectation prevailed up to the time of Christ. And when you read the Gospels, everyone was abuzz that God was coming and Redeemer was coming. There was so much hope and expectation, wasn't there? You, you go into certain circles today, there's great hope and expectation that God's coming. You go into other circles and they mock and they say, where is the promise of His coming? Hope and expectation has always been alive in the hearts of God's people. And it's prevailed for the last 2,000 years as well with the people of God, the church. Every Christmas, every Christian, every church that's ever preached the message of, of life, liberty, and every believer, that every person that's ever came has, to God has always possessed that hope and expectation in their heart. How can this be? It's because when you meet God, He gives you that hope and that expectation. The Holy Spirit causes you to be born again unto a living hope. The other thing that I want to point out about Isaiah's prophecy here in verse 6, and it's something that most of us easily gloss over. If you're listening to Isaiah in his day, and you heard this prophecy, it would seem very, very strange to you that a child and a government is mentioned in the same sentence. You can talk about the message of a, ch a child, someone being born, that's one thing. But the message of a government resting on his shoulders, that would have seemed very foreign and strange to the people in Isaiah's day. Why is that? Because children do not rule in government. Adults do, right? In other words, this is what I'm, I'm trying to point out here. This message of prophecy 
does not separate the child and the son, the child's sons, slash son, from leadership and rule. As you read it, now, it, what it never says, it never says that Christ is going to rule as a child. But if you hear it, you would say, child, government, uh, you know, kind of seems to be a little chaotic. But it, it, the text never says that. The text presents this child being born and that someday he'll rule. So, um, think about this. If a child was leading adults, this would seem like a chaos motif, as we would say. Right? It's chaotic. I mean, you know, you're the parent, you're the adult, you're in charge. You don't let the kid be in charge, right? Now, just imagine... Just imagine if there was a child in the White House. That would be out of the ordinary, wouldn't it? Oh, we've, we've got a president. He's eight, he's eight years old. I mean, can you... We, we watched the media cannibalize Donald Trump for four years. Could you imagine what they would do to this child? It would be chaotic. I mean, can you imagine what the, what the, 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 the press corps in the United States and the world would do? The most powerful position in the world, and we got an eight-year-old. It doesn't seem to fit. And, and, and the reason why I point this out in this passage here, because there's a twist of irony. In Isaiah's day, the government and politics was totally chaotic with adults in charge. That's the point. And from Adam and Eve forward, to Isaiah's day, government was totally chaotic and in charge. Uh, remember God destroyed everything with a flood? That's how bad it was. And is this not true today? Take a look at the kingdom of men. Take a look at governments. It's totally chaotic today. Despite adults being in positions of leadership, chaos abounds. Maybe we should say, give us a child. Right? In 1989, Billy Joel penned and sang a very famous song. Some of you will, will know it. It's entitled, We Didn't Start the Fire. Who knows it? Anybody know the song? You, if you don't know the song, you've got to listen to the song. I think it's, it's, it's a kind of, it's, it's a good song. But, but it's a song alluding to more than 100 events in a 40-year span from 1949, when the year Billy Joel uh, was born, to 1989 when he wrote the song. And it's a, a more than 100 events that he goes through. And uh, he spoke of, uh, of a time in his life where it was total chaos. Everything was chaotic. And I think, I'm not sure, but I, I think Billy Joel's point was that either his generation didn't start the fire or America didn't start the fire. I'm not sure, depending on your interpretation. I think it may more be his generation based on how he wrote the song. But my point is this. It's always, human government's always been chaotic and it always will be chaotic until the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes to reign and rule. And that's Isaiah's point here. And, and there's, a, there's a real prophetic irony in a sense here. When you take a look at most of the politicians today, Sometimes I say an eight-year-old could have done better. Uh, take a look at the eight mayors and governors that let chaos run rampant in their city for months. People dying. People getting their homes burned down, their businesses destroyed. You tell me. Tell me if, uh, uh, if an eight-year-old couldn't have done better. It's common sense. Total common sense. And, and, and I couldn't help but think of what Isaiah wrote in uh, chapter 11, verse 6. Let me read this for you. Uh, he goes on to say, he talks about the righteous reign of the son. And he says, uh, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard white will lie down with the kid. Um, and the calf of the young lion and the fat link together, and a little boy will lead them. You know, we, we see the picture of Christ leading the 
Pharisees and Sadducees in the temple. You know, and so this prophecy speaks of this child uh, leading them. And it foresees the millennial reign of Christ where peace and order is restored and everything is beautiful. A child shall lead them points to the inability of fallen men and women to properly govern in, in a godly way. That's what it means. And I long for the day, and I think you do too, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes and leads and rules and reigns, that we have a better life and a better world here. Because adults have sure made a mess of it, haven't we? Uh, very, very quickly here, uh, I don't know what time it is, and we have no clock yet. That's a dangerous thing. <laughs> quickly consider the names given to this son, because I would suggest to you that the names here are filled with hope and expectation. Wonderful counselor, uh, just a real quick take, where truth and wisdom and honor and integrity prevail. Wonderful counselor. Equity and fairness will rule the day. No corrupt dealings and smoke-filled rooms. Amen? Mighty God, not where might is right, but no empty platitudes and promises. And with God, all things are possible. And his glory will fill the earth. Eternal Father, where Christ governs on an eternal level and not a debased temporal worldly level. He'll execute justice. He won't be beholden to special and corporate interests. He won't show favoritism to you or to me. He'll treat everyone the same. And he will come to do the will of his Father. Prince of Peace, where his priests will rule the day, not the empty peace promised by world leaders. You know, they run around saying, peace, 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 and they don't know that destruction's coming. Because that's what the prophets talk about. That's what Revelation talks about. This one whole global system, peace, 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 and every kumbaya, and everybody get together, and it's going to be totally burned up and destroyed. That's the vision of the world. Satan will be imprisoned, even evil and wickedness will be dealt with properly. So I want you to think about this here. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace. This is God's choice. This is not the world's choice. This is not the people's choice. This is not the choice of big business, corporations, corrupt bankers, insurance companies, big pharma, and Silicon Valley. That's not, Christ is not their choice. He is not the hope and the expectation of the kings of the earth. He is not the hope and expectation of the ungodly. He is not the hope and the expectation of those who fund and prosper from wars. And he's not the hope and the expectation of the military industrial complex. The warmongers. But he is the hope and the expectation of God's people. And so while the world scoffs, God's people have an expectation. And while the world wallows in its sin, God's people hope for his appearing. That's what we do. And we celebrate that every Christmas, don't we? He has come, and we look for his coming. He is the hope and the expectation of all who hold forth the word of life, who long for a better life, not only in this world, but in the life to come. A better life on God's terms, and not on the terms of the world. So when, I, when you look at the Isaiah passage, I hope that it gives you a different perspective than what you may have had coming in here today. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that hope and expectation is bound up in Jesus Christ alone and we know that it's not found in this world because this world cannot deliver from sin and eternal death. Uh, we thank you for your eternal gospel. Uh, we thank you for the promise of a Savior. We thank you that you've delivered on that promise and we, uh, we who know and stand in Christ 
are forgiven, and we bless you for that. Uh, may we take this message of hope and expectation um, uh, outside these walls. Uh, give us opportunities this upcoming week to share the Lord Jesus Christ with someone who needs him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.